Two of the leading lights in this research were Sandra Harding and Helen Longino, represented here. Both Longino and Harding made an effort to reimagine objectivity as a social accomplishment. So there you see the kind of social epistemological approach coming in. The problem, they think, is that objectivity has been linked to individuals. The scientist is this really hard-nosed rationalist who just sort of, you know, sticks to it and is hard-headed and so forth. And what they're saying is that, no, objectivity doesn't happen at the site of the individual researcher. The individual researcher is caught up in all kinds of social forces that even though he's hard-headed and really sticks to the facts and so on, the sort of social character of those prejudices is going to distort his experience of the world. And so they argue that objectivity actually is a social process. It's a social achievement. It's achieved through the social character and procedures of scientific inquiry. Our sociality, they argue, doesn't mean that objectivity is impossible. So that's a claim that you often hear. We're sort of social creatures and we have all these social prejudices and they get in the way of us being objective. And they're not saying that there's no sense in which that happens, but they're saying that ultimately our social nature is what makes genuine objectivity possible. So it's an interesting argument. So one of the things that Sandra Harding is famous for developing is this notion of standpoint epistemology. Now this idea traces back to Marxist theory. To put it simply, the idea is that how we view matters depends to a great extent on our social position. So the position you occupy in the social world and your relative advantages and disadvantage and so on deeply shapes the way you understand and experience the world. So our, our personal experiences of privilege or disadvantage, maleness or femaleness, heteronormativity or queerness, disability or able-bodiedness influence our perspectives on and our interpretations of the world. So all things being equal, and this is kind of the core idea behind this notion that objectivity is a social achievement. All things being equal, a more diverse research community will bring to bear more perspectives on an issue than a less diverse one. And when you bring to bear more perspectives on the issue, you make the shared perspective that the social totality of the scientific research community has more objective. So this leads to Sandra Harding's very influential distinction between weak objectivity and strong objectivity. Objectivity, practiced by most scientific communities, Harding argues, is weak because of the community's homogeneity. For the vast majority of the history of science, the scientific community left out the perspectives of women, people of color, the working classes, and many other groups. Basically, it left out the perspective of the vast majority of humanity. And lo and behold, we find that sexist, racist, and classist theories emerge from those communities. Read in this book, pages 87 to 104, which is kind of case study of when science can go bad. And it talks about the history of eugenics and how the theory of eugenics really got developed in, in America. And, and that this led to mass sterilization of people with mental disabilities. And that the kind of grotesque eugenic theory that was developed in the United States got picked up by the Germans. Some of the American sort of eugenicist scientists were personal heroes for Adolf Hitler. So it's a really interesting discussion that Oreskes offers, and I hope that you'll look at it. But what Harding is saying is, that kind of theory never would have gotten off the ground if the scientific community weren't just a bunch of old white dudes. If the scientific community had all along been diverse, a kind of grotesque theory like eugenics never would have gotten off the ground. Why? Because you would, you would have been standing in a research community with people who didn't look just like you and share your perspective on your own superiority. And they would have said, well, interesting theory, Bob, but that's totally obviously false. Look around you. But that kind of thing couldn't happen because the research community was completely homogeneous. And so if, like Sandra Harding, you think of objectivity as being a social achievement, you would see a homogeneous community like that as one that was sort of characterized by weak objectivity because it's not bringing to bear all the relevant perspectives on the questions that are being researched. So strong objectivity is essentially this idea that there's strength and diversity diversity of standpoint, the standpoints that I was talking about earlier, 
your standpoint, including your beliefs, values, and life experiences, those things affect your work. They affect how you see the world. They affect the kind of research that you're interested in. So the best way to develop objective knowledge is to increase the diversity of knowledge-seeking communities. So that's a core claim that Harding and Longino developed and that has been really influential in feminist philosophy of science, but then ultimately in philosophy of science in general. And it's a very important idea right now. It's having a lot of impact. So the idea here is that objectivity is not a binary proposition. It's not a zero or a one. It's not like, oh, you're objective or you're not objective. Objectivity is a continuum phenomenon. It's something that's achieved in social communities, and you can have more of it or less of it. So it comes in degrees. You can have more and less objective research communities. And the idea is that the greater a community's diversity, the better its shot at achieving objectivity. Just because